one. Hi everyone, welcome to today's episode of Let's Celebrate TV Live. I'm your host, Peter Lee. With me, as always, is the man behind the throne, the power behind the throne, really. The man who makes it all happen. He happens to be my husband, too. That's our Phil Gortimer. Good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Good morning to our friends on the West Coast. And to our UK audience, it's probably dinner time, but welcome. All right, so today we're going to start off with Highball. It's the best cocktail of the day, you understand. Now, let's talk about a Highball today. A Highball is any type of drink that is more mixture than alcohol. So I'm using my favorite VO whiskey and ginger ale today, but you could use it. A highball could be a screwdriver, vodka and orange juice, or vodka and cranberry, even a gin and tonic, because there's more mix than alcohol. No, 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 it can't be a gin and tonic. <laughs> well, not the way we make gin and tonics anyway. Exactly. We make gin with a side of tonic. Well, we're having highballs today. And as I said, this is the best cocktail for the day, you understand. This is probably not the wisest decision that we're pouring a whiskey cocktail while you're going to be playing with knives today. Well, dear, you know, I, I, I think little Edie would approve. Let's get rid of this. Here is your drink. I'm going to come over here. It's just a little easier. There you go, dear. Cheers. Cheers to you. Mm. Just meaning, right. A new meaning to breakfast of champions. Well, fortunately, we had breakfast today, so we'll be fine. Alrighty. So today's topic, we're all about kitchen knives. And uh, you're going to notice I have some notes here. So if I'm looking down, it's because I have a lot to cover and a lot to tell you about. And I don't want to miss anything. And I didn't want to make Phil have to type all this into little lower thirds to appear on the screen or anything like that. I took pity on him for a change. <laughs> and, uh, whoops. and as always, if you've got a question, put it in chat. We will show up your message. Let us know where you're from. Let us know what the weather is. It is 91 here right now in New Jersey. It's expected to go to 100. And with the humidity, it's 105 to 110. So we are cowering in air conditioning today. Which is why we're home this weekend and not up at camp. Plus, we had a family event yesterday that we had to go to. So here we are at LG Manor in the air conditioning. All right. Let's talk about knives. We're going to start with chef's knives. I have in front of me several sizes of chef knives. I have a 6-inch. I don't know which way you can see it better. There we go. I have an 8-inch. You can see the difference in sizes. The 8-inch is probably what you have in your kitchen. Then I also have a 10-inch. And again, you can see the difference in sizes. Chef's knives will go all the way up to 14 inches that you can get them. But you're probably not going to have that. You, uh, those are really used for professional chefs use them. People who are cooking for big jobs, they'll use bigger chef's knife. I go back and forth between the 8 and the 10, depending on what I'm doing. But I like this little 6 inch, and this is good if you have smaller hands too, but there are times when I don't need something quite this big, and I'll use this one. So those are chef's knife. Now what size is right for you depends on the size of your hand, how often you use it, and what you're comfortable with. These are the workhorses of the kitchen, really. So you want it to be really comfortable in your hand. You want it to be an extension of, of your hand. And the best way is to just try them. All right, take a break here for a second. That fast. Our chat's a little quiet. So who's here today? Well, uh, chat, not seeing a whole lot of people. So early. if you're here, mm -hmm. let us know you're here where you're from, and what's the temperature. Let us know you can hear us okay. Yep. And let's see what our Facebook questions are. Okay. All right. There you go. From Janice, I want a really good set of knives, but I can't afford them. 
Well, here's the thing. You don't have to spend a lot of money on knives. Um, kind of like wine, spending more money does not guarantee you a good knife. Now, a good knife is a very subjective thing, and I'm going to talk about that a little later. But you, there are a lot of options out there that are affordable, and you don't have to buy a whole set at once. You can buy them one at a time, which is could be a little easier. All right. Can we move on? Yep. Hang on. Okay. Yep. Hi, Dad. Salem. Okay. Just checking to see if anyone's going to talk to us. They're not. Oh. Sad. Sad bears. I'm just going to put these aside. Let's talk about carving and slicing knives Ooh, today. I forgot the one Next. picture. That's okay. You keep going. Okay. <laughs> yeah, live TV. It's fun. So carving and slicing knives. There is a different. Now I have here, these are carving knives. Uh, they're slightly different in style. This is probably what you're used to seeing comes to a point. Some of them, the tip of the blade is curved like this one is. I guess if you can see it better that way. And really they're about the same. They have a nice long blade, which when you're slicing or carving, if you're carving a roast, you get that one long slice instead of having to saw back and forth. So you get one saw and it makes nicer slices. So these are carving knives. This is an important knife to have in your arsenal. But then there's also a slicing knife. And I put this over here to keep it safe. This is a slicing knife, sometimes called a salmon knife. Now you see the difference in size. This also has all these little indentations on both sides of the blade. That helps things not stick to the blade. This, they call it a salmon knife because if you're doing, they use a lot for when they have a large roast salmon, if it's made into locks or if it's cured and dried and they want to slice and get a nice thin, thin slice from it, this is the type of knife that they'll use. I love this knife and I use it for big roasts, you know, Christmas time when we do our prime ribs and things like that. It's really great to have that nice long action so I can get a slice in almost one swoop. I don't have to, again, saw through. It's about that nice smooth slicing motion. And this is extremely sharp, so I always keep this in a very, very safe place on my magnet back there. So let's put this back for now. Any questions so far? Oh, how do you feel about electric carving knives from Anita? Well, I know this may be a hot button topic, uh, and some of you may not like my answer, but I hate them. I hate them with a passion. I think we had one around here for a few years, but I think I finally threw it out. I don't like them because, you know, there's two blades and they go back and forth like this, but they basically just saw through things. And you get, you don't get nice slices, you get tears and things. I know it, it's efficient when you're sawing up or slicing up, slicing the Christmas roast or turkey or something, but I, I just don't like them. Well. So there. I know you like them, but I don't, dear. I don't. It's not, it's not that I like them, but my job is to always do the turkeys and all that. I got to get them done quick. Well. Actually, I think I use them more in the garage for cutting up foam and things like that than we ever do for yeah. cooking. Yeah, I think we use one to cut up fire starters once. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so those are our carving and slicing knives. Again, you want a nice carving knife in your knife arsenal. Let's talk bread knives. This is a bread knife, has a serrated edge, and it's, for exactly that, they're great for slicing up bread, especially those crusty lobes. And again, it has a nice long blade, so as you're cutting, you can get most of the slice through, and this will break through that, that hard crust. Now, a lot of people like to use these for tomatoes. I don't. I just keep my chef's knife or my utility knife super, super sharp, and that gets it through. But this is also, you may think, oh, I'd never use that, but you'd be surprised. So another one to have in your arsenal. 
And as the manual has to sharpen knives, serrated knives really can't be sharpened. Well, so they're considered sort of disposable. So you don't want to spend I, a lot of money on a I don't know that I would agree serrated. with that. You can, they can be sharpened, but you'd have to have a professional do it. And that right. could be a little expensive. Exactly. So you could just buy, since they're only used for bread and things like that, you could just buy an inexpensive well, one. They hold their edge for a lot longer too, because you're probably not using it every day. All right, let's see. That's our bread knife. Next is a paring knife. Now I have a few examples to show you. Some different sizes. This is from the set that I use. Uh, this is a certain TV chef's brand of knife and I kind of like it. It's very comfortable in my hand. I don't use it very often, uh, but it, it's comfortable. Then we have these little these little chef's knife or paring knives rather that come in different sizes. What would you use these for? These are for little delicate work. You're hulling strawberries, maybe you've learned how to make a mushroom into a flower, so you're gonna use a little knife like this for that little detailed work. Maybe you're making your Auntie Janet's jello salad with sliced grapes. You, you don't need this size knife to slice grapes in half, right? You, you would just use a little knife like this. But what's great is there's two different types, really. This is a forged blade, which we'll talk about a little later. And these are stamped blades. So these are lighter than this type of knife. So people will really like these because for that delicate work, you might want something light. But again, it should be comfortable in your hand. And those are mostly disposable. They're yes. very inexpensive. Uh -huh. You can buy that for six or eight of them for about $20. Right. We use them a lot camping, so if they get a little banged up, we just throw them away. And you can sharpen them and hone them, and you should hone all your knives, but after a while, they're just not the best quality always, so I don't feel bad if I need to throw it out and replace them you know, every couple of years. And I like the fun little handles. Dixie, hi Dixie and Phil. It's 89 outside my back door, please no gin. More whiskey. <laughs> Please no knife throwing. I'm still working on the fry pan mess with you know who. <laughs> so we're still flipping Cheerios, huh? That's awesome. Well, we'll be doing some more whiskey lately. Don't, don't worry about that. Although there's at least one more gin cocktail coming. Ooh, 89 degrees out. Hold I'm, on. I'm glad we're here. Yeah, really. All right, from Bill. How should I store my knives? That's a great question. A lot of people have knife blocks, which are fine. I have a couple. I prefer the ones, you know, some of them, you know, I sit in it like this and they sit on the blade. I prefer the ones that lay flat when you put them in. Uh, the problem with knife blocks or the challenge with them is you have to clean them every once in a while. And you want them that the bottom is open so you can run water through them and allow them to dry because they'll collect dust and, and whatever. I, here at home, on my fridge have a magnet here, and that's really a great safe way to store knives too. Um, you just wanna use some common sense, have them all facing the same way. Like mine, I always put with the blade, the edge facing away. So when I grab them, I'm not grabbing the blade. And in commercial kitchens, the blades are always facing up, not facing down. That way you can't run your hand into them accidentally. Right. So it's considered best practice that the handle be on the bottom of the magnetic Correct. side. Correct, yep. Mm -hmm. All right, so those are paring knives. Next up is a utility knife. And you find, like, whoa, what the heck is that? This is a utility knife. It's kind of in between a paring knife and a chef's knife. It's a little bigger than a paring knife. You can see the two next to each other. These are really good for you want to cut up an apple, you want to cut up an onion quickly, something not as delicate as say a grape or something small delicate work, but something that you don't need a great big chef's knife for. You can do it with this just fine. So I always keep a couple of these in my arsenal. This is kind of optional. You can do everything with a chef's knife or a paring knife, but I, I kind of like this sometimes, for me anyway, this is a little easier. got all these knives on this table. There's all kinds of 
other types of knives out there. It's crazy, it's almost endless. So in my notes and all the research I did, we all know about steak knives. Maybe you have a set of steak knives at home that came with your knife set. Um, but there are things called nakiri, santoku, there are tomato knives, fish knives, boning knives, filleting knives, cleavers. There's knives for everything. Do you need them all? The answer is no, you really don't, in my humble opinion. I have some examples though. In reality, you really only need like three or four. Three knives. You need a good chef's knife, a good paring knife, and a serrated knife, and along with a honer. And everything else you can do. Mm -hmm. So I have paring knife versus utility knife seem to have similar uses. Yes, Kevin, that is correct. But sometimes it's a little easier with a slightly larger blade. Say you want to cut up a hard boiled egg into quarters. I find it a little easier to be to use a slightly larger knife than a paring knife. But that's why I say it's optional. So let's talk cleavers. Wait, 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 wait. We have a more important what? question than, what? than, than flavors. Um, oh, where are we here? Oh, good grief. Yeah, I lost my place. Well, Kevin, you just saw our son's question. Yeah, I know that. that was our son, by the way. Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh. Find the right button here. From Karen, what are you making for dinner tonight? Well, it could be rack of lamb. It could well, be... we can tell them what we did yesterday and why All we're right. doing it. Come on. So we had a little oopsie last night. We were filming this coming week's episode, and we're making pistachio encrusted rack of lamb. And it's in two scenes. So we got through the first scene, it was great, but it was late in the evening when we were filming. We were both tired. tired? I kept messing up. And a little bit too much wine, maybe. We hadn't even had any wine at that point. Well, we, had, we were out at a... We were at a pool party. At a pool party, so all day. there might have been a little alcohol involved. Well, not for me, for you maybe. But anyway, we got through the first scene. We're ready for the second scene. We get it done, and... We're trying to wrap up and Phil realized he never turned the audio recorder back on. So the whole second scene was wasted. There was no audio for it. You just see me going. Um, 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 um. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're going to refilm that this afternoon when we're done here. So we may have pistachio encrusted rack of lamb. I also have an eye round roast to cook. Uh, so we may do that instead. At 100 degrees, we will not be going outside and grilling today. No. The fact that right now we have the air conditioning off for this live stream, it's like, oh, I hope the house stays nice and cool before we get done. Yeah. So, Kevin, if you're wondering, we're having probably Iron Round Roast for dinner. Just saying. Uh, was that an invitation? <laughs> Let's talk about cleavers. Here's a cleaver. I love my cleaver. I don't get to use it as often as I would like. Great big blade, kind of heavy, great for you're doing a rack of ribs, you need to get through those bones. But a lot of chefs will, you hold them like any other chef's knife, but they will be able to do delicate work with them. It's kind of fascinating, especially some of the Japanese chefs and Asian chefs. They are just so used to cleavers that they can do anything that you and I would do a paring knife. But this is something, a great tool to have, again, optional. I don't use it very often but I'm glad I have it when I want it. And like anything else, keep it sharp. It's gonna last a long time. Some other knives. Here's three examples of boning knives. These are three different makers. What, yes. So this one is not one of my favorites. I bought it, I didn't really like it because it just, I don't know. Boning knives are a little flexible because you want to get in between bones and joints and things. This was one of my originals. It has the shape of a boning knife that helps you get in, but it's not very flexible at all. This is my newest and I love it. It's a little lighter, much more flexible. If you can see, see that. And it really gets into all those little places. So if I'm deboning a fish, or breaking down a chicken, and I want to do it a little more delicately, I would use this. Again, these are optional versions, optional 
knives for your kitchen, but handy to have. And do you think he would throw any of these knives out if he's not using them? No. No, I, I, no. I, I admit I have a little hoarding problem. I have a drawer over there filled with knives from, you know, 20 years ago. I just, I might want them. I might want to use them. Actually, this is one of those knives, uh, one of my originals that predates Phil even, that I, I don't know why I still have it. I never use it, but I just can't seem to throw it out. Actually, it's a good thing I didn't because that's going to come in handy in a few minutes. What? Oh, Cliff. Hi, guys. Hi, Cliff and Alan. Glad to see you. <laughs> so those are all kinds of, of knives. My recommendation is that you have a chef's knife. Eight inch is a good place to start. A nice carving knife. This one. A good paring knife. I like this fourth option, as I said, of the utility knife, a little larger than their pair. So these are four that I would say, bread knife is nice. This could be in there, but these four definitely. Kevin, bony knife versus fillet knife. Well, they are slightly different. And a fillet knife, I don't have really an example of that, but they're a little longer and more delicate, and they really are for filleting delicate things, for filleting fish and things like that. Um, but you could do it with a boning knife. Again, that's one of those things I think is all marketing. You know, when they say you must have a, a fish knife and a tomato knife and a boning knife and a filleting knife. Well, if you're running a professional kitchen that you're going to use all those things, yes, but not for the home cook. So here's a similar question from Danielle from Facebook. Okay. What's the difference between a carving and slicing? Well, like I said, the slicing knife is much, much longer than the carving knife. And as I said, if you're doing a big roast or if you're cutting locks or something, you want this extra long way to slice and get it all in one Do you have your slice. regular one there to show rather than the big one? Yes, I had that up. I had there the, you go. I had the wooden handle one up, dear. But yes, this is a carving knife. This is also good, a longer blade, Good for your Sunday roast or your turkey or chicken, but this is just longer. So you, for bigger things, it's nice to have the longer, longer blade. <laughs> All right, Candace, this is a good one. From Candace, I'm afraid of big knives. I always cut myself. Well, don't be afraid. We're going to talk about the anatomy of knife, and then we'll talk about knife safety. So maybe you won't be afraid anymore. All right, I'd like to. Take a minute out here. Okay. And for those watching this live stream and others and who uh, also know us, we like to champion other small YouTube channels because we know how hard it is. It's a good three yeah. year process for most channels to get off the ground and get some traction. So I make it a point to go to other small channels and watch their live streams, watch their videos comment and give them some pep and rah-rah and they come back and watch ours so we've become a nice community. So I want to take a minute and feature two sites on this episode and we're going to feature two on every episode and we hope you'll visit them. Down in the show notes is their um, websites. There. So this is Karen in the kitchen with Karen and Karen is a hoot. She's out in California. She's got a pretty good sized channel and we need to congratulate her. She just got her 5,000 subscriber this week and she's only been doing this a few years. Um, Karen, it was a, um, a private chef, loves cooking. We see she does some camping and she's just a lot of fun. One of the other great advantages of go visiting small channels is small channels can take the time to answer a comment. Mm -hmm. So go to these channels, leave a comment, and you'll get an answer. Yeah. Just like when you come to our channel, every time you leave a comment, we'll answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my other favorite site is Mitch and Philip. They used to be called The Cooking Queers. They're now much more of a lifestyle channel. Um, I join their live stream every Tuesday. It's 6 o'clock on the East Coast, 3 on the 
the West Coast, they have a very lively chat. And they have a lot of also small creators that we chat back and forth with. But they just have way too much fun with too many things, including mocktails and arts and crafts and doing some stuff. So go visit these two. Again, check out the links in um, the description of this show. Even if you're not watching this live, go check them out for us. And when you come back to our live stream in the future, we'll give you two more to check out. All right. Yay, Mr. Philip, and yay, Karen in the kitchen. All right, let's move on and talk about the anatomy of a knife. Did you find that image that I, I... did. Okay. That's what I was running around typing. All right. Let me get it so for you. You can get it up, and then I, I will... You can come back to me, and we'll go through it. So that's the anatomy of a knife. That's all the little parts of it. So you can come back to me, and we'll... There we go. There I am. <laughs> okay. We can go back and forth. Yes. So, you know, knives have an anatomy. And it's important to know the parts of the knife. It helps you with knife safety and with maintenance. So we have the point, which is pretty obvious where that is. The blade. This is the blade, the whole thing. The edge. I'm not going to touch it, but that's the sharp part. That's where you cut the edge. Right? The tip, this area here, is the tip of the knife. This is the spine of the knife, the backbone, as it were. Then we come to the heel, which is this area in here. That's when you're chopping through something big, you push down on the heel of the knife. Next is the tang. I'm going to show this knife has a little better tang on it, which is this part here. Some makers have different tangs. Some are a little thicker than others. Sometimes the tang does not go all the way through the handle of the knife. I prefer ones that do. It gives you a little more strength. Handle. That's pretty obvious. That's just what you're holding. You want the handle to be comfortable in your hand. That's the biggest thing I can ever preach about buying knives is it should be comfortable. Because if it's not comfortable, you're going to get fatigued. You're not going to want to use it. You might cut yourself. So a comfortable handle. The bolster. Again, I'm going to use this. This is the bolster here, this area. Some knives, because this one doesn't have that big of a bolster. This one has a bigger one. I have other knives I have even bigger than that. What that does, it gives your hand a place to rest. It gives you a little more protection. Um, but it, it isn't really necessary. Not all knives have them, but they have this back of the blade here, which is also part of the bolster. I prefer knives that have a little more rounded edge here. I just find them more comfortable. If I were to show you a knife that didn't really have one, it would be this knife. It's kind of here in the handle, but it's not really that much, and I find it's easy to slip off and, and do that and cut yourself. So I prefer knives that have a little more here. Again, you could just throw it out. Just say. And maybe I will, but isn't it a good thing that I saved it all these 20 years because I knew someday I would need it. So maybe after today we'll throw it out, dear. <laughs> okay. These are the rivets or the fasteners, these little dots. They go all the way through. And then, of course, this is the butt of the knife. So that is the anatomy of a knife. So if someone says, you know, the tip or the spine, um, Oh, I didn't talk about the tang. This is the tang here where your hand goes on the handle. But that's the most important part. But if you hear someone say the spine of the knife or the bolster, now you have an idea what they're talking about. Now there are two types of knives. Well, there's more than two types. But the way they're manufactured, let's switch my notes page. Some knives are forged, some are stamped. What's the difference? These are stamped knives. The camera I'm at. There we go. And the difference is this is one sheet of steel, and a machine comes through like a cookie cutter and stamps it out. Modern knives are really pretty strong, the modern stamped knives. One of the big differences a lot of times 
when you have a stamped knife, the tang does not go all the way through the handle. In this case, it does, but I don't know about this knife. I can't see it. So it, it may only go to here. It may only go about halfway. I don't know. And why that is important, it, it just gives you more strength and more stability in the handle. This is my preference. It's a forged knife. It has the bolster. It has the tang all the way through. And it is exactly that. It's forged, kind of like a blacksmith at a forge. It's made from steel that's heated up and then pounded out and going through a whole process to get this one shape. So that's a forged knife. Now the big difference too is this is much lighter. A stamped knife will be a lot lighter than a forged knife, but the modern forged knives are even lighter than the old ones. I have from my original collection, and I won't tell you the name, but here we go. These are very similar knives. This one, even though it's an eight inch knife and this is a 10 inch, this one is several ounces heavier, and it's very noticeable. And I find when I use this, because this was one of my originals, has this great big bolster here. After a while, I get tired. And this bolster, the edges are kind of sharp on it. This one, it's round, it's more comfortable. So yeah, this is a great knife, but it's a little heavy. So that's something to consider when you're buying knives. So that's the type of knife of how they're made. How often should I sharpen my knives? Well, Harvey, <laughs> we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. I sharpen mine, what, what do we do, like every six months or so? Yeah, it depends on, yeah. it, it's going to depend on the quality of the knife and whether the knife is a western knife, which is 20 degree angle, or an eastern knife, which is a 15 degree angle. 15 degree angle knives are significantly sharper, but they do require sharpening a little bit more often and a special sharpener. 20 degree knives will generally hold a little longer, but that still depends on the quality of the knife. And how you use it, too. And how you use it, exactly. You know, I always say I like wooden cutting boards, maybe plastic, but never a glass cutting board, never cut directly on a platter or on a sheet pan or something because you're gonna dull the knife and ruin the platter or the pan. Always use a cutting board, whether it be wooden or plastic. So, buying knives. Everyone, will, oh wait, why aren't you at camp this weekend from Patty? Well, Patty, we had a family event to go to yesterday. We had a graduation party, um, which is very nice. And it's 100 here and it's in the 90s up at camp. And Philip would be miserable if we were up in the mountains in 90 degrees where there's no breeze, no, air, no conditioning. air conditioning. It's a and very, very primitive campground. Yeah. There's not enough electric for people to run right. air conditioning. So unless you have a medical condition, so, yeah, I would not do well. Right. And, and, and we'd be on like, that deck and we would just be sweating and miserable. I would and, be sitting in the car with the air conditioning on. Yeah. Been there, done that. Yeah. So we're at home this weekend. It worked out that way. We're lucky. But, uh, yeah, that's why we're not at camp. And I'm very glad. <laughs> Plus, camp has other challenges. There's noises and people walking by, making comments and... Uh, I'm kind of glad to be home <laughs> this weekend. It's a little easier for us for these live streams. So let's talk about buying knives. Everyone always asks me, and I know it's two of my chef friends too. There, people ask them, oh, how do I buy a knife? Take me, what, what should I buy? Buying a knife, it's a very personal thing to me. Now, you might want to buy a whole set of knives. I prefer to buy them solo so that I can decide what I want, decide what I like. Maybe I don't need all the knives that it comes with. Like, I don't need another set of steak knives, but if I want to replace my knives, I'm going to buy them solo, most likely, meaning one at a time. Now, they come in a wide range of prices, and like I said, you don't have to spend a lot of money. I'm not saying go out and buy a $20 set of knives, because they're not going to last, but you don't have to spend $1,000 either, especially if you don't have it to spend. You know, you can get one for a couple hundred dollars, 
You can buy them piecemeal and work up to what you want. My biggest thing, I've been saying this all day so far, is it has to be comfortable in your hand. You know, if you're using this all day, no matter what type of knife it is, when you pick it up, it should automatically feel like an extension of your hand. So you can do exactly what you have to do and you have complete control over it. So a lot of people, when they get started, will buy these box sets that have, they advertise 16 knives, 20 right. knives, whatever. Don't let that number fool you. Most of the time, six or eight of them are steak knives. Right. The steak knives are throwaways, so you take them right out. And the bigger sets, historically, are in the lower end stores, they want you have a lot of knives. So for the price, the quality is not that right. good. You could actually spend less money and buy your three primary knives, your eight inch chef knife, your paring knife, mm -hmm. Yep. Um, a honer and a serrated knife for less than you pay for the whole set and you'll have them forever. The other thing is, is that you have to buy them from a store that you can try them. The problem with the box sets is you can't put them in your hand until you get them home. This is a case for going to the stores like the Bed Bath & Beyond, right. the or Cut Hopper the Cut store. all these places that have a case because they will take them out and you can put them in your hand and try yeah. them. The other thing is that once people find a knife they like, they're proud of it. So yeah. check with your friends. Ask to pick up and try their knife or ask them what they use. And I'm sure they're going to show you a drawer full of knives that they don't use, looking your way, that they didn't like for whatever reason. And they'll be glad to tell you. But pick the knife up and try it. If you're going to buy them on Amazon or mail order, then at least be knowledgeable that you could return them if you right. don't like them. Make sure like you can them. return them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And really, the handle is the biggest thing. I really prefer this type of handle. It's just the most comfortable for me. Some people, like on my slicer here, the only option is this plastic type of handle. Now this is very similar, it's the same make as my other knives, so the shape of it was very comfortable for me. Um, but not all these plastic handles are the same. Some knives have completely round handles, some have more square, where they're artsy looking, and that's why I say you really have to hold them and make sure that they're comfortable. All right, here's the question that will get people fired up. Uh, what brand of knives do you have? Well. <laughs> What brand don't I have? I've had a lot of brands of knives over the years. I've had Hoffritz, Chicago Cutlery, Wusthof, Henkels, and I have settled on Mercer, and Phil got me this set. Um, I had had Hoffritz and Henkels for years. I love them. I, I, I was very comfortable with them, and for my birthday a couple years ago, he got me this set of Mercer knives, and he got me a long with this really nifty carrying case so that when we take the show on the road and do live streams and things, I can pack all my knives in it and you know I, I can be comfortable. One of the biggest things I, I cringe, and when we used to cater, I used to cringe at it when I go to other people's kitchens or if we're at dinner at someone else's house and they I offer to help and they say, sure, cut up the lettuce. And I get their knife and it's dull and horrible and, and you know. So Mercer uh, uh, Culinary, well, you going may somewhere not with see that, in okay. the stores. Um, uh, they are very popular with culinary uh, schools because they can provide them with an entire set in a bag of every single one of the knives. And they are the sharp Eastern 15 degree angle. Yeah. So they're great learning. Um, we actually have a link in the show notes to um, a couple of the Mercer knives that we really like. Yeah. The 8 inch chef knife. Um, in fact, we just bought a set for our son Kevin who's on here for his birthday because he was eyeing our knives way too much. They are not really expensive. The chef's knife is $40. Um, and you just can't go wrong with them. Um, there's a lot of good brands out there. You'll never go yeah. wrong with the Henkels or any of those, you have to decide what your budget is, right. but if it doesn't feel good in your hand, it doesn't matter what the name brand is. So I was getting there, but thank you. 
Oh, well. So this is my set of Mercer knives. This is the entire set that he bought me. Originally didn't have the 10 inch or the big slicer, and then we added them later. But um, yeah, I love them. And he bought them for me because he did a lot of research and paid attention of the knives I use, the type of handle, and things like that. All right, so along that same line, Sarah says, which brand which is brand the best? Which brand is the best? Uh, not going to touch that question, Sarah. It's a very personal thing. I am in love with these Mercer knives. I had never heard of them before, so prior to that I would have said Hoffritz, maybe Henkels, uh, and now I'm in love with Mercer. So to me, the Mercer brand is the best, but you decide, you, you try some knives, and you know you may prefer Cutco or Chicago Cutlery or Henkels or Wusthof. The best brand is the knives you're actually gonna use. Right, exactly, exactly. All right, how do you hold a knife? Seems like a silly question, doesn't it? How are we doing on time? Got about 15 more minutes. All right. All right, we'll get through the rest if you don't interrupt me too much. <laughs> no promises. Yeah. So how do you hold a knife? I keep saying it should feel good in your hand. For any type of knife, and I'm going to show you on a chef's knife, you want to use the pinch and grip. So you pinch right here, right above the bolster, wrap your fingers around, pinch and grip. That gives you the most control. You can do that with a parry knife. Pinch and grip. Same action. You can do it with a cleaver. Pinch and grip. It's the same action. That gives you the most control and it keeps it comfortable. What you don't want to do is that, having your finger on the spine. It's not going to give you any more control. It actually kind of makes the knife slip around a little bit more. If you're doing this, you're right in the center of gravity, you can have better control. When you're this, you're pointing and pressuring down here, so it's very easy to slip. So pinch and grip is how you hold a knife. And when you do that enough, it becomes second nature. It's kind of like, it just occurs to me, it's if you ever played softball or little league as a kid and the coach told you to choke up on the bat, right? So you went up the bat more, that's what you're doing, you're choking up on it. All right, how do you clean a knife? That's a big thing. And I see people doing it wrong and I cringe all the time. Um, the first most important thing is, please don't put your knives in the dishwasher. Now I know, I know what you're gonna say, you're gonna say, my dishwasher has a special slot for my knives. My knives say the dishwasher safe. I don't care what your dishwasher says or what your knives say. The hot water and abrasive detergents, first of all, are very bad for the knife. It's, the water is going to get in between the handles. It's going to make things rust. These are stainless steel, not rust-free steel. And the other thing is, even with the special places in your dishwasher that say for a knife, this is going to move around. Things jiggle a bit in the dishwasher. It's going to start scraping off the coating from all the tines or whatever and that's gonna cause problems in your dishwasher too. And it's just not good for your knives. I keep saying that, so please don't put them in the dishwasher. So then what do you do? I clean my knife after each use. I chop up some garlic, I have a cloth, I wipe it off. Never this, well maybe from the spine, but it's not a good idea to do this. And never ever with the edge into your palm like that. You wash them in soap and water in the sink. Again, use your sponge like this at the spine, push towards, if there's some grit on there or whatever, push towards the edge, not against it. Switch hands and do it this way. Same thing. It's at the end of the day, it's this big. It's not a hardship to clean it properly. It's just bad habit to do this or do that. It seems easier, but it's really not a good idea. The other thing is I like to dry them right away. But if you have to let them drip dry, please, in your thing, point down. I don't know how many times I've gotten nicked at camp 
because someone dried the knives and put them like this in the dish drain. And I didn't see it and went, oops. In fact, I don't know if you can see this. Let's see if we can zoom in on that camera. I have a little scar there. Can you see that little line right there in between my fingers? That happened to me on my first cooking job when I was in high school at a place called Marty and Barb's, which is no longer there. And one night, it was my turn to do the dishes, and one of the other kids was helping out, so he filled the sink with hot soapy water and put stuff in it for me. What I didn't know was that he put all the knives in too. So I reached in, and there was a sharp little paring knife like this, and guess where it went? Right in between my fingers, pretty deeply. So that was <laughs> a little traumatic at the time. We, we were afraid that I really like cut a tendon or something. Unfortunately, it, it looked worse than it was, but it was a really shocking uh, common sense kitchen safety lesson for all of us teenagers in the kitchen. So that's another tip. Never ever put all your sharp knives in hot soapy water because you can't see what's under there. Wash them one at a time. All right. Honing a knife and sharpening a knife. Let's start with honing. You wanna hone your knife before you use it every time. Whether it is a cleaver or a chef's knife or a paring knife, you wanna hone it. Probably your knife set came with one of these. This is a steel and it has some ridges on it. Some of them have more than others. Sometimes they are flat and wide, sometimes they're ceramic. Uh, this is the kind I'm used to using. The easiest way is to put a cloth down, point down so it doesn't skid. You take your knife at the heel and right to the tip. Just go right down. You don't have to put any pressure. You can do both sides and practice doing that. You see chefs, you know, sh -sh 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 -sh, you know doing this, doing this. Someday you might get to that, but the safest way is like this so you don't slip and cut yourself. Now, why is this important? When we use our knives, the tip starts out like that, and as you use it, it starts to bend a little bit. Honing is going to straighten that edge back up, and that's what we want, a nice sharp edge. After use, it does that, so you hone it to that. And I always like to wipe it off after I hone it, just in case. And it's a reminder that it is not sharpening it, it is right. honing it. Correct. So it's refining the sharpness that's already mm -hmm. there. And this is especially true if you've been doing lots, switching back and forth between meats and vegetables with the yep. same knife. Right. Or if you're doing this a lot, um, you want to keep your knives sharp, as sharp as you can, and honed. Why? because a sharp knife is gonna do all the work for you, and it's gonna be a lot easier. Now, we've talked about uh, tomato knives and serrated. I have a little tomato here. A lot of people insist you must use a serrated knife on tomato. If your knife is sharp enough, just like that, I'm not pushing, I'm slicing through, and it's not smushing it, it's not ripping it or anything. So you don't need a special knife, you just need a sharp knife. That's the important thing. The other thing is a safety thing. If you do cut yourself, and you will, everyone does, it's much better, believe it or not, to be cut by a sharp knife than a dull knife. Why is that? Because the cut will be a clean edge, a dull knife will tear, and a clean cut will heal easier. Now the other statement for that is, is dull knives cause more accidents because you tend to push down harder right. on the knife or saw it back and forth more than you need to, right. which then, especially if your finger's on the top, make it unstable and then you cut yourself. A sharp knife requires little or no pressure, right. so you tend not to have those accidents. And that also helps you with getting fatigued while you're using your knife. If you're having to do a lot of extra work and your arm is getting tired, that's when accidents happen. All right, so we already covered these, but we'll just show them. Yes, Dixie, we do not put any no. 
professional sharp knife in the dishwasher, period. And Cliff asked the same question. Uh, we do not. not. It's never a good idea. No, Even if it doesn't do. hurt the blades, it does hurt the handles after a while. Yeah. Yeah. So don't ever do it. Don't, don't, don't. I mean, obviously, you guys are going to do what you want to do. I can't tell what you do in your own kitchen. That's your business. But my recommendation is don't do it. Okay, so we did answer this from Kitchen isn't Zero. Isn't holding and sharpening the same thing? And no, it isn't. And sharpening is exactly that. It's sharpening it. After a while, honing doesn't work anymore, and the blade just kind of, the edge rather, kind of does like that and gets dull. And no amount of honing will bring that back, so you have to sharpen it, which is grinding off a fraction of a bit of the blade and forcing it back into that nice pointy edge. You can buy sharpeners uh, in any kitchen store or most department stores, and like Phil said, there are some that are, the most common one does a 20 degree edge, and that's the most common. They're very easy to use, just read the manual. Uh, you want to do that you know, a couple times a year. And you, you really, really want the electric ones yeah. that have three phases. One changes the angle, one grinds it, and one does it. The little small ones that they give you, they just go back and forth. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do them on a good knife. They're really not very good. They're fine for paring knives, and that's about it. So you would expect to pay about between $100 and $200 for a good quality electric sharpener, but they're not limited to the knives. You can do them for everything except serrated knives. Right. If your serrated knife does get dull and you've bought a good one, like mine's pretty pretty good quality, I would send it out to be sharpened. Now, my recommendation for that is if you can't find a knife sharpener in your yellow pages or online or something, make friends with the butchers at your store or if you have like an Amish market or something and there's a butcher there. Make friends with them because a lot of times a good butcher will know how to sharpen a knife and you can get him or her to do it for you or maybe for a small fee. If you befriend them and, you know, compliment them, things like that. So I think that is about it. Um, storing knives, don't throw them in a drawer. Oh, when do we get to see the new studio from Captain Chaos? Well, the studio construction has begun. We have the lower cabinets in place. We are shopping for countertops. So hopefully in a couple weeks, we will be debuting the new studio that we're building. All right, any more? Um, not yet, I'm looking in. All right, so while he does that, we can talk quickly about storing knives. I have a drawer full of knives that I don't use that, yes, I'll empty it out later. Uh, but uh, I don't like to just chuck them in a drawer. I like to use either knife block or here at home. We invest it in one of those magnetic strips, and those are so handy, um, like I say. But keep them in a nice place. Uh, the knife blocks are very safe because, especially if you have them at the back of the counter, kids can't get at them, cats can't knock them down, things like that but don't just chuck them in a drawer because then you're gonna reach into a drawer for your potato peeler and you're gonna grab this and cut yourself and it's gonna be a big mess. And when you have them in a drawer, the opening and closing the drawer causes them to bang against each right. other. Which will so you end up getting and, nicks and, yeah. and all sorts of problems with them. I have a friend who's a chef and her kids, I went to her house once and all the tips of her knives were broken off, all the points. And I was like, what happened here? She said, oh, it's from the damn kids just throwing the knives in the sink when they're done with them. Like, wow. <laughs> Isn't this a... Uh, from Paul. How about an episode on wine? <laughs> Which we're, we're doing this weekend. We're working on that, actually, on that concept. We, we would love to do a live stream on different types of wines and different pairings. We may be a little toasted by the end of it, but, you know, it might be fun. Well, here's a good one. A special night over just did on Friday. Oh, I love that you brought basic skills back. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, we, they're fun to do. The challenge for basic skills episodes for us is really that, uh, what is the basic skill versus the basic recipe? And that's where we kind of argue sometimes. So, but we're learning that it's things like how to bake a potato. I am shocked at how many people don't know how to bake a potato. And that's something like, how, how could you not know that? So we, we are bringing basic skills back. We took a break because we couldn't figure out what our next episode would be because, well, that's a recipe. That's a skill. That's not a skill. So we're going to come back with just some basic stuff and, and we'll see how they go. 
All right, you got any more about knives? Because we're coming to the last five minutes. No, uh, that is my tutorial on knives. I just recommend invest in a set or in a few good ones and you'll have them for years and years. And again, ask your friends, can I pick up your knife? Can I yep. try it? Yep. Don't immediately dismiss, as, as much as we've said the box sets aren't that great, don't immediately dismiss them. They would be a good starting point. Mm -hmm. Something like the KitchenAids, even that you can buy in the local Walmart. Right. They're not bad. They're just not, don't expect, if you're getting 20 of them, they're gonna be all top of the line. But it could be a good place to decide right. what you like and what you don't like. Here but, at home, I have Mercer. Up at camp, I have two sets of KitchenAids because I have a kitchen in the camper and a kitchen on the deck. So I have two full sets there of KitchenAid brand and they're pretty decent too. And the stores are no longer around. Uh, but Hoffritz used to make knives. They were yeah. always in the corner of every single mall. Yeah. They were a mall staple. I think Hoffritz is out of business now. I don't know. But um, There's Wolfstoff, there's Henkel's, those are all good brands. Yep. Uh, <laughs> we have some cat lovers here. From Aaron. How are the cats? I'd love to see them. <laughs> the cats are fine. Uh, you may have heard one fussing earlier. He was around my legs. That was Salem. They've been very vocal today, Salem and Preston, but the four of them are all fine. Uh, we know one day we're gonna be here cooking on a live stream and uh, one of them is gonna jump up on the counter. I don't know why it hasn't happened yet. Uh, in some of our other videos, you've heard them and seen them. From Doug, why don't you always wear your glasses? <laughs> That's because sometimes I wear contacts. It depends on my mood, how tired I am, if I feel like messing with them. The other thing is, these are bifocals, so when I wear my contacts, like if today I'm reading printed notes, I'd have to put on my readers, and I just felt that was too much to go back and forth. Um, if I were just demonstrating or reading from my teleprompter, uh, I would probably have my contacts, but depends on my mood, really. What else, dear? Is there one? Who's that from, from Cat? What's Kat. up next for LCTV? Well, we're gonna be doing some lamb very soon, later today, actually. We have a lot of new concepts coming. We have a lot of new episodes. I have some recipes to test. I'm going to be testing a honey cake recipe later this afternoon, and uh, hopefully demonstrating that for you, because I haven't done a dessert in a while since the pudding cookies, and I've been wanting to do a little dessert. Um, Holidays are coming. I hate to admit it because it's getting towards the end of July, but they'll be here before we know it. So we are working on foods for the holidays coming up, those extra special celebration things. And we're also, because of the fact we like to feature other small channels, mm -hmm. we have now made friends with a bunch of small channels, include a couple of baking channels in the UK. Yep. So we hope in the future to either be doing a collaboration or, or have a single recipe Okay. that multiple um, creators will create and we'll sort of compare them. And so we'll make this one and then send you off to Karen or to Mitch or to Some the, the dozens of other ones that we have made friends with. Yeah. Or we might see if we can get them collaborated and, and bring them in as a feed into our live stream and see what we can do. And we're still working on taking the show on the road. There are some festivals we're looking at. We're looking at considering getting a booth at and just being there as a presence. Some of the food festivals that are coming up in the fall. Uh, there's a big pumpkin festival here that's local that I'm looking at maybe getting a table at. That'd be fun. Um, yeah, we got all kinds of stuff in the works. So keep tuning in and tell your friends. All right, all right. so it's been an hour. We hope you've learned fast. something. Um, we will end the show in a few minutes, in a minute or so. We will stay in chat for about five minutes. If you have any last minute questions or you have an idea, in two weeks we have a live stream. It's called Midnight Munchies. Yeah. It's about all those bad things that you go out to a diner for at midnight or two o'clock in the morning after you've come back from places. So we're gonna have a little fun with that. Being that we live in New Jersey, which is the diner capital of the world, this China should be very, very appropriate. I think it's going to be a mostly cooking episode. I see lots of fried foods because what do you want? You know, back in my day, what did we want when we got done at the clubs at two in the morning? We wanted greasy fried foods. Disco fries. Yeah, fries, mozzarella sticks, 
yeah, wings, things like that. So that'll be fun. Just don't tell my Noom coach. All right. So from me, Phil Gordimer. And me, Peter Lee. Thank you for tuning in today, joining us for our live stream. And remember, tune in on Tuesdays for our regular episodes and Fridays for our basic skills and cocktails and every other Sunday for these live streams. All right. And we'll see you in two right. weeks.